We are going to, today we have a, a webinar. Uh, this webinar is part of the program of the uh, subnetwork on sport and physical activity. Uh, to date, this uh, subnetwork has 18 members from nine countries. But as I said before, we are going to increase the number. The University of Palermo will join and also other uh, universities. Uh, I remember that this, the subnetwork is composed by the universities that are already uh, mem partners and members of the um, family of UNIMED. Uh, the main objective of the subnetwork is just uh, to foster the members' collaboration on research projects. Uh, publications or to, to share these projects, uh, to promote educational activities. Here is just an example, summer school, lifelong learning courses, uh, intensive courses for uh, PhD students, and also to facilitate a flow of information on web seminars, workshops, conferences, show, so let you know uh, all the uh, activities that is organized by uh, each of the uh, subnetwork uh, partner and then to organize the university sport events I remember this year will be also the 30th th th uh, anniversary of the year and then we'll have once again uh, a calendar of uh, sporting events that are going to uh, um, to organize and then uh, also to to facilitate the participation to projects for funding programs, but not only this, also the range of uh, students and uh, professors. So, but this uh, uh, will be discussed in detail uh, in detail when we have very soon a board uh, with all the contact person of the uh, subnetwork. But today is just to the main idea of what this subnetwork is, uh, uh, what will it will work. And then uh, we'll have also a webinar series. Uh, all of us, uh, we know that we want to, to return to a front tactics, but this will be, this is the hope for this year uh, for our activities in our university. But uh, the webinar uh, is a resource that we will maintain because it's the, the only resource that we can have uh, to share sales with people that live obviously in uh, different countries. Uh, we are going to have also is a detailed uh, series program of, of webinars. I, I read it this title, but I don't want to share today because I want the final word uh, after to discuss in detail uh, during the, the board meeting that, as I said, we will have with the responsible of each partner. But the webinar will uh, found uh, will be founded on two, the, let's say the two legs, no? The two legs of the webinar, so sport and physical activity. So we'll have aspects related for coaching inside uh, the student coaching career or sport management also on the side of the physical activity with determinants and patterns of physical activity we find an effect of promoting the mediterranean diet and physical activity and also uh, very uh, many other aspects then uh, in particular for attendees that today uh, you are, are attending this webinar we have also our email contact, so you will be uh, informed directly from the uh, contact person of the subnetwork, but also indirectly uh, for, uh, receiving our email uh, for the next, uh, the next uh, webinar programs. So uh, this is in general, really uh, in few words, the, uh, the main uh, content of, uh, of the subnetwork. Uh, maybe oh, I, I uh, return the ball <laughs> to Marcello Scali and then we will move on the presentation. Thank you very much, uh, Antonio. You very much. Uh, first of all, let me say thank you very much for your participation today. Uh, I know that is a very complicated period for all of us, full of online uh, 
activities and uh, at university level, but also at personal level. It is quite complicated to, to for all of us to manage such such particular particular moment. Um, I, I would like just to address you a few words about the UNIMED in itself and the reason why we decided to move to work also using these sub-network modalities. Um, some of you are already familiar with the UNIMED activity, but probably some of you are a newcomer um, informed or by your university or by other colleagues. Uh, but first of all, UNIMED is a uh, as uh, Antonio said, is a, a network of universities. We have 133 universities from 23 countries of the Euro-Mediterranean region. We have universities from all Southern Mediterranean countries, from Morocco to, the, to Syria. We have also universities from the Gulf, few universities, and then also from Iraq, which is a new, a new country for us. And then we have uh, universities from all the European Mediterranean countries, from Portugal to, to Greece. We are based in Italy. We have uh, 30 Italian universities, for instance, but several from Spain, France, Portugal, Greece, Cyprus. Uh, we have a few universities also from Albania and one from Finland, the University of Tampere, which is uh, quite active with us. Uh, as Antonio said, we celebrate this year 30 years of activity and for a network, uh, an university network, such UNIMED is uh, an important anniversary of our life. At the beginning, 1991 was a very small network with around 25 universities and then year per year we grow through projects, through our activities, through the networking that we do daily. We work on more or less on three main areas. First of all, we do services to our members because we have to know that UNIMED is an independent network. We are not financed by any government, not European government, not at national level, or the European Commission, not from uh, the Arab world. We are financed by our members, first of all, which pay an annual fee. And then we are financed by our projects that we are able to, to be financed most of them are by European Commission. At the moment, we have around 40 projects uh, financed by European Commission. Uh, we have a team of 20 people that work on this on this networking and project dimension. And we act as a sort of facilitator for our members to improve the internationalization of our universities. We don't act as another university. We don't need another one. We have one, more than 100 members and we uh, look for the scientists uh, interested to cooperate with us. The second main area is fundraising, obviously. Fundraising is very important not only to finance our activities, but also to act concretely among us. To do projects is the way to explain to our international interlocutors that it's possible, it's possible to cooperate in the Euro-Mediterranean region at our education level, research or capacity building level, and to offer our competencies to build a new uh, Mediterranean generation. And the third activity is uh, we try to do some lobby with, in front of international institutions to, to invite them to pay more attention to Mediterranean cooperation. Uh, in the recent years, we decided also to uh, looking at the interest of several universities on a specific topic of our cooperation we decided to launch this second level of network that we called sub-networks. Uh, and we started with a few ones, but year per year, thanks to our members, we launched a new one, new uh, sub-networks. At the moment, we have around 12 sub-networks on many different aspects of our uh, cooperation, food and water, for instance, climate change, uh, tourism, journalism, but also uh, mobility and intercultural dialogue or uh, employability, which is another important topic and so on. The main idea is to discuss with scientists, with either faculty or department or professor on a specific priority. And once we have a look to all the potential priorities, one was exactly about sport and physical activity. 
Why? Because obviously, as uh, Antonio said, it is uh, an important element of our life, first of all. But it's also the way to pass a message of in, in this particular region of the world. Uh, we need to, to, have, to move to a positive storytelling about Mediterranean cooperation. And I believe that sport could address a very good message in this, in this direction. In addition, looking at your expertise and your interest, I, feel, I see also many potential in connection with the other sub-networks, for instance, food and water, or as we already discussed, why not also with migration, which is another important sub-network that we have, but also discussing about digitalization and so on. Uh, I think that our cooperation, uh, as UNIMED, I mean, uh, need to have uh, more uh, input coming from the scientific community. We discuss at UNIMED level daily with rectors and vice rectors de delegated to international relations, and obviously with the uh, uh, Office of International Relations of your universities. But we need your support, we need your uh, contribution to go more in detail about our cooperation and to find many other possibility of uh, work among us to offer to our students, our researcher, our professor, um, to you, to our community, opportunity of cooperation in this amazing region uh, of the world. I thank you very much for your participation today, for your interest to, to join UNIMED activities, and I leave Antonio to manage the session, and I stay with you for all the meeting. Bye. Thank you, Antonio. Uh, thank you, Marcello, uh, for your uh, very important words. Uh, also, I want to thank also the uh, now that I'm, I'm watching more in detail the name of the at uh, least I I can I recognize some of the contact person of the sub so. <laughs> we were exchanging uh, emails uh, uh, last week so we, we will have been, uh, i can promise this uh, a board meeting and then we will discuss in detail all the of the subnetwork so moving on the presentation uh, i want to invite the speaker professor giovanni fraiese i, I will read a short note giovanni Fra he, I know him very well also because he's in my department, uh, my university. Giovanni Fraiese is Associate Professor of Applied Technical Sciences at the University of Rome for Italico and Coordinator of the Scientific Council of the World Farmers Organization. And in this case, we'll have also at the end of the presentation, I will invite uh, the, um, Lu Luisa Volpe, that, that is the head of the policy of Department of the World Farmers Organization also uh, uh, to, to introduce itself uh, and maybe also the connection we can have between uh, UNIMED and in particular our subnetwork and so prestigious organization. But uh, coming back to uh, Giovanni Fraiese, he researches in the fields of endocrinology and cancer focusing on psychoneuroimmunocrinology and how thoughts processing alters hormonal secretion, leading to condition of health or disease. But this is the official, uh, um, the official introduction. But uh, for UNIMED, I think it is very, very important also to know what that Professor Freyese has also participated in uh, several medical, humanitarian medical missions in Neymar, in Islandia, in Albania, and, and also volunteered very often uh, with some uh, Italian hospitals. So uh, he's not only a very good scientist, but he's uh, first of all uh, a person that is very involved with humanitarian activities. And, and I think this is an aspect that is very appreciated in UNIMED. So, Professor Giovanni Fraier, I cannot say the, the stage is yours because we don't have a stage, but <laughs> the, the... No, maybe... Okay, perfect. We... Um, 
Okay, uh, thank you, Antonio, for the extremely nice introduction. Maybe I'll give you some money later after this is finished. And uh, thank you to Marcello for hosting me, me here. And thank you to all of you for being here uh, to listen to these few thoughts of mine. Um, what I'm going to do is not exactly a presentation. I'd like to call it more uh, food for thought. Um, it's not going to be anything too medical or too technical or too specific, but it's supposed to be something that is going to leave you wondering about, you know, how your mind really works and if there is something else that we haven't developed enough so far and, you know, what possibilities do we have in order to actually learn uh, that we can control the mind and not being controlled by it. And in a moment like this one, it's extremely important because as, as this virus is changing the way we're living all across the globe, um, there is a big problem, which is fear, uh, which is growing a bit everywhere and shifting the directions of politics and policies. And, and fear is never a good thing. As, as I'll show you in this presentation, you know, fear is basically stress for the body and, and, um, and for the mind. And by changing the neurotransmissions, it actually affects uh, the immune, immunological responses. So the more we fear, the less we are able to actually cope with viruses or other medical problems. Oh. Uh, Professor Freyes, I just kindly ask you just to be more close uh, to the mic because times we we don't have always the same uh, power for your voice okay thank you um, i'm going to share my screen okay can you see it Yes. Okay, excellent. So what is the mind? Uh, it's, it's an interesting question. Uh, something, you know, that we sometimes forget to ask ourselves, you know, how does the thinking process actually works and, and, and what does it mean? And actually, there is no real, you know, uh, de definite answer so far in scientific terms to what is the mind or how it works. It's usually very interesting, especially in the Italian language, which is of course my mother tongue, to go looking into the etymology of the words because it means uh, having a glimpse on what the ancients actually, the way they developed uh, the language, and, you know, the words that they actually chose had a, a deeper meaning sometimes than the one we use today. So in English, the mind is the organ or seat of consciousness. So the organ would be the brain. As the seat of consciousness, we are not sure where that is. So it's a faculty by which one is aware of the surroundings and we experience emotions, remember and make decisions. So it's very undefined after all. In, um, in Italian, that is slightly different uh, because um, as you'll see, pensare, uh, it, it's got a very interesting meaning. Uh, in neurosciences, so talking in scientific terms, the thought is considered to be the act of elaboration of the information that comes from the sensorial inputs. So what we see and what we hear and and whatever, everything that is sensorial, it, it gets basically within the brain, somehow it gets reorganized and it comes out with, with a thought or an idea or an emotion. What exactly is, is a thought? Um, as I was saying, in English, as you can see, it doesn't really, it, it, it's although, even if, however, never yet, it's, it's everything and nothing at once. In Italian, it comes from pensum, uh, which is the ancient word to weigh. So it meant uh, the wool originally, once it was cut, it needed to be weighted raw 
before being treated and then worked by the people. So it, it basically meant a raw material that needs to be treated to become something else. It's, it, it's, it is somehow as if they already realized uh, that actually you know, the thought is the reprocessing of all the information that we get through our senses. What you can see in the image here, it's neurons firing in a rat's brain. So in scientific terms, what is a thought? It's, uh, it can be registered as a, an exchange of, of energy from one side to the other of the brain or a, a passage of electricity as it is. The brain is, is the, the one on the left, it's a design by Leonardo da Vinci and uh, it's, it's a very particular, usually we call it machine. And the reason why we know something about it, it's actually, we don't know much about it, but what we do know, it, it actually comes out from people having accidents and having damages in certain areas of the brain and then connecting uh, the damage to those areas to whatever the patient is actually incapable of doing or the problem that he's having. Because of course there is no way of actually studying um, entirely well what happens uh, within the brain in, in, in a number of occasions. Now we have something which is called functional man magnetic resonance, which is very interesting because it allows you to see which zones of the brain get activated during a certain activity, from sports to uh, other kind of activities and, and the frontiers of neurosciences, cognitive neurosciences is this one, trying to see and understand better the way that the different parts of the brain actually do talk to each other in order to make us experience reality as we know it. We have roughly the brain is can be divided into the right brain and the left brain. The left brain is supposed to be more rational, analytical, uh, reductionist and it's the, the language areas. The right brain is more abstract, intuitive, holistic, and, and creative. Um, th they work basically in very different ways. In fact, for example, people that are, I don't know, inventors or um, painters or, sculptor, or sculptors, uh, they basically develop the right brain more than the left in order to actually uh, create something. Our whole society on the other side is actually based on the left brain. So we are taught how to be rational, how to be analytical, how to be uh, precise and reproduct reproductible in what we do basically. Um, it is just one part of the, of the brain. The other part is mostly taken out of the equation as you know, emotions or other state of being can actually hinder the logical process that we can have. Um, but this is not the right way to do actually things. That, uh, it's common understanding that if you actually manage to use the right side and the left side together, the whole probably has got the capacity of having a lot more insight than just using the left side. So what is reality? Uh, it's basically something that starts with the vision so whatever we see, it gets to the eyes, then from the eyes, it gets to the back of the head. And then it goes uh, to, to the front of the head by crossing the areas that are linked to the emotions and to the past experiences. So what I'm trying to say is that there is no objective reality that we as human are actually able to see. A machine can record reality as it is. Uh, we cannot even see it as it is because the sensory input that comes through the eyes, it gets modulated by certain areas in the brain by our, let's say, emotion, and it gives us the picture of what we're really seeing. So if we are in a nervous or agitated state, uh, we see something actually. If we are seeing something that reminds us of something else that happened in our past, what we actually see is actually modified by that past we're not seeing the present for what it is. So it, it's important to understand this, that you know, our reality is basically filtered by our, by our own minds and it's never objective in any way. 
there is an ancient saying of the Talmud that we do not see things as they are, we see them as we are. And that's exactly what it is. Neurosciences, as I said, are still very young. Mm, what we've learned so far is that we can try to register the, the flow of energy of current within the brain. What, what you see in the top right corner are the brain waves uh, of a person, the way that they can be recorded through an EEG. And what you can see here is the functional MRI I was telling you about. It's a scan of, of a brain and you can see the different areas being used, the blue and the right and the red and the yellows that get activated during you know, certain sort of uh, activity that, that we are doing. So we know how some of these areas now get uh, in, in collaboration with other areas, but not much more than that. We can actually divide the way our minds are working in, into, let's say, five major uh, wavelengths. Um, the passage of energy is basically, it, it's a, it gets recorded as a, as a wavelength. It's got um, the more frequency, the higher the frequency of, of the energy, uh, the shorter it's, it's the wavelength or the wavelength, wavelength uh, one after the other one. Uh, it's like having the gears in our mind. So basically, we, we have a mind that is able to go into five different gears. The problem is that we only use uh, the, the first one, let's say, which is beta. Uh, I'm talking to you now, I'm using in this moment, if, if I would have some connectors to my brain, I would be in theta. A, sorry, in, in beta. Uh, that's the concentration, the learning, the talking, the whatever we normally do. It's it's our usual, let's say, state of mind. But we know for ex from experience that you know we can we can be in different states of mind. What do I mean? You know, the more, for example, relaxed I get, the more the wavelength of our thoughts change. So, if I'm in a more, let's say, relaxed state, I would say sort of uh, natural state, you know, uh, relieved by worries or troubles at the moment, such as walking uh, close to the to the seaside or something like that, and just not having many thoughts in my mind, then I would be in alpha. Uh, the thing is that whatever we experience, that state of being is basically a different gear of your mind then we can go even lower in, in theta. Uh, that usually happens when we are sleeping. It's extremely difficult to be in that wavelength while we're awake because we don't know how to do it. And it's linked to the state of REM at sleep. And, and it's, uh, as you will see, these different states of mind actually do reflect in the hormonal production, which means physical changes. We have delta, which is the lowest one, and we are not conscious as when, when we are in delta, and it's the deep sleep. So it's when actually the body is recovering entirely the energy, and we are not even aware of what our mind is actually doing. Once again, these are the, the four main. Uh, I have left out the fifth one, um, which is gamma. Uh, gamma it's a very different wavelength because it's sort of the joining of all the others together. It's a single moment that usually it's where the whole brain takes part of the activity that we are doing in that moment. And it's usually connected to, I don't know, uh, brilliant insights or, you know, new connections that weren't seen before. Uh, it's just to make you an example, it's probably what happened to Newton when he was sleeping and he woke up because of the apple. And in that moment, the whole of the brain got activated and he got the idea of gravity. Let's, let's see them a bit more in, uh, in detail. So beta, once again, it's the one that I'm using now and the one you are using now. It can be recorded with a frequency from 12 to 
32 hertz and it's it and is who you know you are and, and what we are exactly right now and unfortunately the state that we live 95 or more percent of our lives alpha is a more relaxed state so the frequency is lower it goes from 8 to, to, to 12 and it's a state in which we are physically and or mentally relaxed uh, it can be practicing yoga relaxing uh, or or sort of dozing off and it's a state that everyone is actually have, has had the experience of it and you can see for yourself how different your thoughts are when you are acting in, in alpha as compared to beta. Alpha, it's important because it's connected to what is called the flow state, and it's got something to do with sports in particular. What is the flow state? It means basically that when while someone is, for example, practicing an activity, it could be surfing, it would be, it can be football playing, as I'll show you in the example where my mind is not hindering me. I'm completely in the game or in the zone, which means I'm not thinking about anything else. I'm just, you know, flowing. The goal you're going to see is, according to me, one of these states. Um, the whole action you're going to see, it, it lasts about one, one and a half seconds. And if you actually imagine the kind of complex movements this player does, in such a short period of time, you realize that it's not something that you can actually do by thinking at it. It's something that just happens because you let it happen because you are in that particular flow state. It's a corner kick and it's the back heel from Roberto Mancini in, in Lazio Parma. Uh, I could have shown some other goals, but as you can see, this is a technical uh, you know, movement that if we could ask the player to repeat it again, I'm sure he cannot do it, you know, even if he tries it a hundred times. It's something that just happened in, in that moment. Theta waves, we are even lower, so four to eight hertz, and it can happen to the people that are actually still able to daydream. So when you are there, but your thoughts are entirely somewhere else, on why we are actually sleeping. It's been connected to a, a boosting of creativity and intuition. And it's, um, it's a state of mind that most of us actually don't do not know at all. Delta is the one we have in, in the deep sleep, and it allows the brain to recover, regenerate the neurotransmitters and the body to recover as well. Gamma waves, as I told you before, it's one of those rare moments where the whole brain sorts of lights up and, uh, and we have these incredible uh, connections that usually we are not able to do. Now, as you can see, uh, there are different speeds, let's say, at which our mind goes and they're linked to different states of being. Now, the question would be, is it possible besides you know going to sleep for example to actually shift our minds into these different uh, gears and and the answer is yes but i'll get back to this in, in, in just a second uh, if you if you look at children you see that you know the way they actually think and act it's of course extremely different from ours that is not just because they lack the experience uh, of, of pain and, and, and other problems like that, but it's also because their brain functions in an entirely different ways. So as you can see, the younger we are, uh, less our brain, let's say, waves are. So you have delta, which is basically you're not even there from zero to two years, and then you go to theta and alpha up to 12 years, then you get to beta. You know, once the hormones kick in, it's done, you're always in beta, basically. So what is thinking? Uh, we don't know. It's a passage of energy. You can see it, you know, in a very creative and poetical ways, you know, as in the image on, on the left, or you can see it as a neurochemical and electrical activity of the brain. But still, you know, what, what thinking is, we don't really know. 
According to the East, thought is a force such as gravitation or repulsion. It's not something you know that we are entirely uh, responsible for. How do we see thought and the mind in, in the Western world is based on scientific mechanicism and it began with this guy, uh, René Descartes or Cartesio and, and the famous cogito ego sum. So I think, therefore I am. So from there, you know, we began pointing all our um, attention uh, of what the mind is on the scientific side, on the left side, let's say, of the things, forgetting basically about the insights of, of the right brain. The concept of mind and body as two, two different things, it began around the 17th century with Cartesio, and he divided the body as res extensa and the mind and as res cogitans. So they are entirely two different things. One is the body, the actual reality, as we call it. And the other one is the world of the ideas, which is uh, not connected to the, to, to, to the body, basically. This is his own original uh, design. Uh, the first one on the left, um, you, you see the eyes transmit whatever they see to the pineal gland. Uh, which is where your soul is resting and it's entirely it's completely separated from the body it's like the body is like a robot and there is another driver in the pineal gland and in the second design the driver commands the arms and the legs to move according to what he has seen The vision of the world has changed a lot uh, anyway in east and west so in the West, we developed the logical thinking starting from Cartesio and, and the, the basically the ability to create a science that is able to see things in an objective way that can be uh, quantized and made in ma into math and objective. On the East, uh, the, there is a different vision of the thought and the mind. They think as you know, the, there's only one huge, let's say, uh, mind, it's called the Atman, and the humans ref reflect this collective mind, let's say, it's called Jivatman. It's very interesting anyway that Cartesio men mentioned the pineal gland. Uh, it's, it's, a grand, it's an endocrine gland which is within the brain, produces the melatonin which regulates the day and sleep uh, patterns. So it shifts basically the, the wavelengths of the brain. It produces serotonin, which is the sort of happiness molecule and a very peculiar one, which is called dimethyltryptamine. This is something we produce only twice, apparently in considerable amounts, which is when we are born and when we are dying. It's a sort of a, an hallucin hallucinogenic uh, substance that basically allows you to enter and exit from this world in a less traumatic way. It's very interesting that this compound uh, was discovered by some ancient uh, tribes in the Amazon uh, in a peculiar way which shows um, the acting of the right side of the brain. Uh, ancient civilization actually learned things in sleep, uh, not, you know, because of a logical uh, advancement of the ideas and as we are used to do, but just, you know, as pure intuition. So the story goes that this shaman was given by the, the god of the rain, uh, the recipe to mix two very different uh, plants together from two very different places of the Amazons and uh, by creating this potion they could communicate with the gods. Uh, science has discovered that you know what is in this ancient uh, plants is this dimethyltryptamine so it allows the shamans over there to being in that state of mind where we are when we are born and, and we die. The most important thing is to understand that thought and body are not separated at all. You know, we are, it seems obvious, but 
you know, I hope you understand it's more obvious and more proven than we think. Um, whatever we leave in our minds, it reaches the pituitary gland that transforms it into matter hormones. So if I'm happy, it goes to the pituitary gland and I'm going to produce certain hormones. If I'm sad or angry or nervous or I'm in fear, it's going to go to this gland and we produce other hormones and I'll show you. The pituitary gland controls all the hormones in the body, the thyroid hormone, the adrenals, uh, the sexual hormones and so on. So whatever our body is in the end, it depends all on which hormones these glands tells us to produce. The mind is actually very, very easy in a way, it's sort of binary. So it knows a whole range of emotions and states of mind and, and of being, but we can simplify it into either I'm relaxed or I'm stressed. If I'm relaxed, I'll, do, I'll produce certain chemicals. If I'm stressed, I have to produce others in order to survive. In particular, I have to produce cortisol, which is made by the adrenal glands and is what allows us to survive to stress and fear. So cortisol, it's actually a life-giving hormone because without it, we just die. The whole body just shuts down. So it, it's a survival mechanism that allows us to survive, but it comes with a cost. Every time we produce cortisol, uh, it means that we are in stress and for the, for the mind, that stress, it's like being chased by a lion. So it, it's, it, it's a very powerful moving force and it creates cortisol and a, a, a number of other hormones that are going to let us survive to this emergency. The problem is that when we were young as a race, we still are, uh, the problem or the stress was for example, finding the lion or the creature. Then, you know, once the, the problem is gone, we return to a relaxed sort of state. Today, we leave the stress in our minds all the time. And it's like we're being chased uh, by the lion all the time. That basically ends up activating those uh, endocrine channels all the time. And here, I won't go into detail because we don't have the time. It's all the systems that are actually affected in a negative way by the cortisol uh, that we need in order to survive. So basically Western life, you know, it makes us live in a very high pressure environment, which is outside of us and then is reflected inside of us. But if we only live into fear or into stress or into this kind of emotions that today, unfortunately, is what is running wildly and a bit everywhere in the world, I would say, then besides what reality is, our bodies, you know, will start producing cortisol and the other hormones. And the main action of cortisol is lowering the immune defenses. So this is medically wrong what they're doing anyway with this virus, because we don't need to fear things. We need to face them. We need to be relaxed the same way, because the less fear we have, the more we get sick. I, I hope I do get this message very clear because it's what it actually regulates the whole immune system. Um, usually cortisone is given by doctors when there is an, an overactive immune reaction of some kind. So if you want to shut down the immune system, you give it cortisone. Cortisone and cortisol are basically the same molecule. So, what is thinking? You can, you can see it as, you know, the, the waves moving on the sea and it's the wave it's seen on the east. It's something that never stops, that it's always acting and, uh, and we're always in beta. Uh, the way that antidepressant works is actually by lowering the frequencies of our minds. So in order to be relaxed, we can you know, learn how to do it and control the mind sort of in a way, or we can take chemicals that actually do get the same effect. How can I calm the mind? Is it even possible? Yes, it is. It's just that you know, we have never been taught how to do it. In the East, it's been something that's been done for millennia. Well, well you can see here, um, it's uh, in a functional MRI of, uh, of a monk that has got more than 10,000 hours of meditation. 
it's been medically and scientifically studied to see if their minds for whatever reason might actually work in a different way than, than ours. And that is the case. This is just a sort of a recollection of what happened in science and discovery of connections between meditation so that lowers the brain functions and physical uh, manifestation. And so we have reduction of blood pressure, reduction of cortisol and improve of immune function and a lot of other things. But we have a, a shift of attention from the left to the right brain. So we, we start to actually integrate more the two, the two sides and we shift into brain waves. So from being in always into beta, you know, the mind goes more to alpha and theta. So changing the way the, the wavelength is also changes the way you actually think. It, there are some indications that it might even prevent or slow normal aging, but we don't have the time for this. This gamma hertz, uh, the gamma frequency that I told you is the rarest of all. Uh, scientists were sort of baffled to see that the, the monks that actually they did uh, the EDG, um, they were always in gamma. So it's like by low, while learning to lower the frequencies, they've learned how to use the whole brain together. And we have no idea of the, the perception that they have of reality, but we know that it is completely different from our own. So this is food for thought. So the whole science is based on the idea anyway that uh, we can actually perceive things as they are in, in an objective way. Uh, I won't get into too much because I think we're almost there. Uh, but quantum mechanics and physics has actually shown that if we observe something, we actually alter the results of what we are observing. So basically, the, the whole point of thinking that we can achieve uh, a totally unconditional point of view of reality is basically wrong. As a, another food for thought, uh, there is an, a sort of experiments that were made in, um, in Japan, in an island. In, um, in 1952, they observed some monkeys for 30 years in their natural habitat and they did some experimentations on their behavior. So they started leaving some potatoes in the sand. Then they were discovered by the, by the monkeys. One day, one of them uh, took the potato out of the, out of the sand and washed it in a nearby river before eating it. Uh, <clears throat> the, um, Someone the day after saw the same thing. Uh, so the day after, let's say, a couple of them started actually cleaning the potatoes from the sand in the river. Then the third day, there were five. And at a certain point, I don't know, I don't remember which day, all of them together started doing the same thing. But what's more interesting is that other uh, monkeys of the same species in different islands, so they had no idea or possibility to see what the others were doing. At the time that they started, everyone, everyone started cleaning their potatoes, they did the same in a different islands. Such as, in a way, you know, the information had passed from one place to the other by reaching a certain critical mass. Uh, I wonder if, you know, human mind works at all in the same way. So, there is no point in being worried, actually, and about the future, or what is going to happen, because this puts you already in a, um, uh, in, a, in, a, in a condition to become more sick and, and lowering your immune defenses and, and living even worse. So we need to pay attention to where our thoughts go and try to actually direct them somewhere else. So if you, we actually know ourselves a bit better by understanding how our mind and our emotion works, uh, then you know, we would leave fear uh, of the virus because fear in itself, it's a virus. 
And it seems to me that now, you know, the critical mass uh, that I was talking about of the monkeys, we probably have reached it in, in fear in human population. And we are letting fear uh, running our decision, our economical and political and scientific policies. And I think that, you know, Mediterranean being the cradle of civilization and this whole uh, fear thinking it comes from a different culture than ours. We should probably stop, think again and see, you know, what can be done better in order to actually live better than we live in today. Thank you very much. So, uh, thank you very much, Professor Fraiese. Thank you very much, Giovanni, uh, for your very interesting uh, uh, presentation. Uh, I, I will just give a few minutes to the attendees just to, uh, to collect their, in my, their, uh, their question. And I would like to invite uh, Luisa Volpe, the head of policy of department of the World Farmers Organization, to, to have a very quick intervention. Uh, we are uh, this this uh, this intervention was not uh, on the agenda, but uh, we are very very happy to have this kind of connection. And we receive uh, your invitation, please. Luisa Volpe. Yes, can you hear me well? Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Tessitore, for this opportunity, and thank you also to Professor Freyese for inviting me. I won't be too long because I know it was uh, out of the agenda, but uh, I hope we can resume this conversation maybe offline. Um, just a few words on the World Farmers Organization and why we created this link. The World Farmers Organization is a member-based organization. Our members are national farmers organizations. We are independent as you are. We are funded by our members as you are. And uh, also, uh, I think that part of your mandate fits very well into our mandate that is advocating for uh, favorable conditions, let's say, to promote sustainable diets, uh, healthy nutrition for all worldwide. We are also um, a worldwide-based organization. Most of our members come from the Mediterranean area and the Arab states. Um, and we are very much interested in uh, bringing the perspective of the farmers in global dialogues on uh, nutrition and uh, healthy food systems. We fully recognize that um, farmers can bring their practical experience, but uh, their solutions must be validated by science. This is why we have established together with Professor Freyese um, a scientific council within the organization that he coordinates. And that is why we are also fostering our partnerships with the scientific bodies worldwide. This is the framework I can uh, give today, Professor Tessitore, but if you have uh, uh, further questions, we can discuss now, or as I said before, in uh, another occasion. Thank you very much. It was super interesting. And thank you, Giovanni, because your uh, speeches are always very much inspiring. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Essa Volpe. Uh, uh, you already mentioned the several links that uh, we can have with subnetwork, but uh, I can see that we can have a more uh, collaboration with the UNIMED in general. So uh, for this reason, I'm happy uh, that oh, the, the direct general director, Marcello Scalisi, uh, has seen your introduction uh, and I'm sure that we will organize uh, a, a meeting and then we, we can dis discuss more in deep about this. 
Uh, I don't know unless Marcello Scalisi want want to add wants to add something uh, on this. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Luisa, for your uh, brief introduction to us, and obviously thanks Giovanni for your presentation. Just to mention uh, about our partnerships because it's important to underline that Unimed is normally. Um, signing a memorandum of understanding but not theoretically one but very concrete with very interesting international organization to try to make a bridge among unimed members and those institutions just to mention uh, fio uh, european training foundation and european investment bank or uh, uh, union for mediterranean and some others and uh, the, the main idea of this uh, joint uh, partnership agreement is to as I said, to make a sort of bridge among our members and those organizations working at regional level or worldwide, because uh, our capacity is to arrive in the field through our members easily. And this could be interesting for you to discuss directly with universities in the region, but also to, to improve in some way the capacity of universities to talk to other actors. Uh, in the region and to open the door to the society at large. Uh, this sometimes is something that is very a missing issue in our universities. And I have to say not only in Southern Mediterranean country, but also in the European side, time by time, depends by, by situation. I welcome, uh, we, thank you, we thank you this opportunity to cooperate with you also. And I think that we can talk uh, in a bilateral uh, meeting soon, and then we will explain to our members Thank you. Okay, so we can uh, come back to the presentation and then open it to the questions of the attendees. Uh, I, I'm, uh, I need to ask to uh, Ludovica because I know I not see here on this uh, Zoom, I don't see the digital uh, hand that you can raise for questions so probably uh, we can directly uh, if you want to you have, you have to go to reaction yeah reaction and just uh, turn on your uh, your video your mic and introduce yourself oh there is also the chat and um, now i think Okay, in the meantime, La Bolos uh, is thanking for uh, the information, the int very interesting thing. Uh, she's, she's tell, saying, uh, telling, need more, please. Uh, yes, uh, we will try to organize other uh, uh, webinars, as I say, the beginning on different uh, topics. So this is the first uh, initiative we had. So, uh, Professor uh, Fraiese, Giovanni, I, I, I have one question, uh, more than a question, uh, just a comment. Uh, as you said, we can be in different states of mind, states of mind, uh, you have also demonstrated this. And then you, you have concluded your intervention, your presentation with the, for, the, the, for the virus, uh, for the pandemic that we are living in, in this moment. So how uh, these two aspects can be can be combined and also in your opinion uh, how a positive state of mind can help to uh, to survive in this particular period. I'm not talking about surviving in uh, uh, physically to the virus but surviving psychologically that is the most important part. Well, well, thank you for the very good question. And um, yeah, it, it's the whole point is this one. I mean, you know, besides from, from the science that has been used so far and the way it has been used, which is sometimes questionable, um, there is a medical side of this, which has been just plainly wrong. Um, if you go to a doctor and, and you're sick with something, the doctor doesn't tell you, oh, you know, it, it's, a, it's a disaster, uh, you're going to die. Uh, 
because somehow that, that's what is going to happen in the end. Uh, the, the doctor, even if you're really sick, it's going to give you, you know, a positive view of the things. It's going to encourage you or to calm you or to tranquilize you because it, it's part of the healing process. You see what is called the placebo effect. It's actually misunderstood. Mm. We are taught in the university and into the scientific world that the placebo effect is something that you need to exclude from your um, uh, researches uh, because it's sort of an interference that you know the mind somehow can actually cause into the responses that we get. It's not entirely clear, but I'll make it very easy to understand. If I actually give, um, I don't know, let's say uh, an homeopathic pill to someone, so there is nothing inside, and I tell him, uh, this is a drug that is going to lower your blood pressure. If the person is actually trusting me that that thing is going to lower my blood pressure and I take it, there is no drug inside, so nothing should happen. But what happens is that I do get the blood pressure down. So there is a physical effect. It's not just a mind idea, it becomes real. Same thing is if I think that I'll be healed or that I'm okay, my immune system is working very well. If I'm thinking that, you know, uh, I can get sick tomorrow or I'm very afraid, then this survival mechanism, it starts in your mind and it becomes a sort of loop. And in the end, what I'm doing in that moment is producing cortisol. The more I produce cortisol and I need to do it because otherwise I don't survive, the less my immune system works. So it, it's a direct correlation. So the more I'm worried or stressed, the less well my body is going to fight against infections, for example. So the first thing we should all do is, you know, we, we need to study, we need to understand, but we need to le let this fear go. To begin with, you know, it's not an Ebola virus that has got 40 or 50% death rate. According to the CDC, we're talking about 0.1 to 0.5% in certain ages. So there is no reason actually to be this much of afraid of, of what is happening. And, I'm afraid that the picture we are seeing is also because of the way we are reacting to the situation, which is fear. Thank you very much for your answer. And I, now I can see the digital hand raised by Professor Maurizio Tollo. Uh, he's a professor of the University Gabriele D'Annunzio of Chiedera. He's an authority also on the field and uh, is a researcher on, on this field. So, uh, please, Professor Bertoldo. Thank you very much, Antonio. Thank, Thank you, you, Professor Freyese, for uh, providing all these uh, insights on mind-body relationship. Body. So, uh, what I uh, thought uh, listening to your presentation uh, was a, a theory uh, that was developed by uh, colleagues from Lebanon, uh, that uh, is a, a, a country part of UNIMED, and uh, he developed the uh, hypofrontality uh, transient, transient hypofrontality theory that was interesting related to the state of flow in which uh, we have a hypoactivation in the left prefrontal uh, brain. And it became immediately in my mind because it is interesting uh, to, uh, to see what happens also in the different parts of the brain, not just in the different neural oscillations. And uh, what do you think about that theory? So this is my question. What do you think about this uh, hypofrontality theory that is not so, uh, that do not have too much uh, uh, research um, or experimental research uh, uh, about? Well, thank you very much, first of all. And, and, and uh, I absolutely agree with you. It's. Uh, the frontal or prefrontal um, part of the brain is the one that we are using now. It's the one connected to logic, is the one we use most of the time. 
uh, it's the one that actually you know re requires us to think it's so the only way you can actually be into an alpha or you know flow state it's by reducing it so you're not actually thinking the way we are used to think it's 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 just a different entirely different gear of the body so the left part of the brain the analytical one stops and you know the one that it's actually let's say alive in the present it kicks in sort of in a way and in that state uh, you know what we can do it's amazing i mean i absolutely agree with you because it's uh, it's something that should be explored much more we can actually you know try to, to do it ourselves if someone is interested as well because it's a, it's a frontier of actually understanding you know how to improve uh, the way we handle our minds and ourselves. And you know, if, if the mind is working actually better and it's free on, of a lot of fears and pains and constraints, then you know, whatever insights we do get, they're extremely interesting. And usually it could be those game-changing ideas that you know, everyone is looking at the moment so far, but we're not really finding. And that's because you know, we need to use the, our minds in a different way. You know, Leonardo da Vinci, there are a couple of writing of his where he doesn't go into much detail, but he says that the way he actually had his, this invention, he was sort of in a kind of a dreamy like state during the day. And he said that by having um, violet um, windows and the sun coming through them, so sort of violet rays, that would help your mind to go into that state. It would be a world of things to actually study. Okay, so thank you to both for the very interesting question and also the, uh, the answer. Uh, are there any uh, questions? I don't see uh, digital uh, handies, but as I said before, you can in any moment there to is turn on. In the chat, oh, okay. Okay, so uh, Hala Youssef is asking uh, Giovanni uh, how we can consciously pass from a frequency to another. So it's maybe a good research in sports neuroscience. It is. I mean, it is. We can pass. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, you see, the, the mind is like a horse. In our experience, you know, the horse goes where he wants. You're not usually able to control your thoughts. You know, they come and they take you where they want. But this is just an illusion, just to give you an idea. If someone is suffering for, I don't know, let's say heart problems, such as in marriage or other things, and, you know, and you're suffering and you're suffering and you're suffering and your thoughts always go there, you could always choose, for example, to think about something else, such as, I don't know, a waterfall. So you picture in your mind, let's say, a waterfall and you imagine the color of the water, the sounds, the details, or, or whatever, if you're engaging in this sort of activity, the mind you know, has got to let go of the other. So you can actually, by using your will, you can shift, for example, what you're thinking into what you're de you've decided to think, which is something that most of us don't realize. And, um, in sports, what happens if you see football players, for example, you know, they, they usually are with headsets before, you know, the game. It's probably unconsciously, you know, what are they trying to do? They're trying to sort of get into themselves to find, uh, you know, that um, peace to actually play the game with all those people around, not, not anymore at the moment, but it used to be like that. And in order to find, you know, a sort of concentration. Uh, all, all the great champions I would, I would see, you can see that, you know, they play sort of equally well almost if they're home or they're away because 
they they manage to be in flow states at times during the day during the game it would be very nice to actually teach them uh, how how to reach that state more, more easily and it could be done but it's uh, it's something that needs to be learned thank you also for this uh, are there any other questions directly or within the chat Maha Jarrad is thanking for uh, the, the webinar thank you also for your participation okay so I think that uh, we are also on time with, with the agenda this is very important and uh, now last but obviously not least I would like to okay, now uh, she is also uh, in we can see Ludovica De Benedetti because now is time uh, I was thinking to to do this and, uh, and then to thank Ludovica Benedetti from the uh, Unimed staff uh, because uh, what she did for uh, this webinar has, has been really very important. She gave not only su technical support but uh, really uh, uh, she is the staff that has been assigned by the director Marcello Scalisi specifically for this uh, uh, sub-network. So, uh, she is very in deep with all activities and this uh, uh, her support is continuous every day so i really want to thank you ludovica for uh, all all your support thank you antonio for this thank you, antonio, for this <laughs> and thank you everyone for and your also time. if thank you, you want to see now i if you want to say something to the uh, because here are also some of the contact person of the of the sub network. Yeah, yeah. I just want to thank yeah, you, everyone, I just for want to uh, your attendance, you. for the inspiring interventions of our uh, speakers, and even for the unexpected contribution by Luisa Rotte, who has just left us. I I have read on in the chat, and uh, of course, thank you to all participants for your interest and uh, for your question. Okay, and now uh, uh, I'm also a professor of sports science, so uh, before we the final word for the, uh, like the referees three whistles now, uh, to Marcello Scalisi, I want just to, to thank you, all of you once again, and then to remember uh, to the contact person of the network that we will come soon, very soon, with the with an email to organize the meeting and also all of you that uh, have find the, uh, found the into this webinar to remember you that we will we, have also another webinar in March then we, you will receive uh, an email now we have also your uh, your contact uh, please uh, Dr. General Director Marcialisi uh, the, the closer well, is uh, your. Thank you very much. Grazie mille, Antonio. Thank you, Giovanni, and thank you to all of you for your participation. Uh, every time that we at Unimed we organize meetings with our sub networks with colleagues of our community, we learn something. We learn about your obviously your topic, your uh, scientific issue. We learn something about. Uh, your uh, needs, your your country, what you are doing, and what you are thinking about our cooperation in our region, and these enrich our capacity. In, and obviously, not to to become a scientist in your topic, but in some way to address our message to you clearly and better, and to try to serve you and to support you in this in this perspective. And please follow us on our activity. Uh, not only looking at your uh, dimension, but also looking at the Euro-Mediterranean cooperation in itself. This year will be an important year because the new program of the European Commission will be uh, reformed. This, uh, the new Erasmus Plus program, for instance, will start from 2021, is already started formally, until 2027. 
there is a lot of to, to do in terms of capacity building, but also in terms of research, in terms of mobility for our students and researchers. It seems that also sports be, will be an important uh, key issue of Euro-Mediterranean cooperation for the first time. And we have to, to, to better understand how the European Commission is moving on this. And I think that also in addition to the scientific cooperation, we have to use also sport activities as a intercultural dialogue. UNIMED already did something in, in the past. Uh, we already organized it, for instance, the UNIMED Cup, a small initiative, nothing big, unfortunately. We are not able to do big issues, but it was very interesting. And uh, uh, again, it was an opportunity for students to meet each other from different countries and to try, as I said at the beginning, to establish this Mediterranean generation, able to understand each other, able to use our differences as a richness and not as an obstacle. Um, you can play an important role in this perspective, and I can ask you to, to work with us more and more to support our daily activity in this uh, dimension, and why not provide us your ideas, your uh, suggestion, to do something more for our for our community, and me and obviously Ludovica uh, and all the uh, team, team will be at team your team disposal team to to work with you, you and, and, and to learn from, from, from you uh, more and more about our cooperation. Thank you again, Thank you again Antonio, for your commitment. Your commitment. You are very not only committed to UNIMED, but to this region, region to our cooperation. To cooperation. And without yeah. your <laughs> Daily work, it's impossible to manage a sub network. And thanks again, thanks Giovanni, again Giovanni, Giovanni, Professor Giovanni Pagliese, for your contribution. Thank you very much. But Marcello, just uh, 30 seconds before, because you were mentioning about the Unimed Cup, I had a, a slide <laughs> just to show. Uh, this was uh, the, uh, one of the tournament that uh, UNIMED has organized. This was organized in 2016 and it was a food, female futsal tournament. Here is the picture of the Universitat de Barcelona, so the University of Barcelona on that uh, addiction and what we are preparing for this year is a program supporting events uh, we will not uh, do a step back uh, or with the with the with the pandemia. We will, I think, we will try. We will try the possibility to have different, maybe different sporting events, and then when we, in the first part of the year, and then if it will be possible to travel, we'll organize. Uh, a new UNIMED Cup also in Rome, the collaboration also of Sapienza Sport because we were already planning this uh, and then we will be able to arrive to the General Assembly of UNIMED for the 30th year uh, to celebrate these 30 years also with a program already uh, done of sporting events. I'm sure So, thank, thank you very much again, again. Thank you. and see you thank soon you. in the next occasion. Bye. 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 Thank you, Ludovica. Thank you. Grazie, Rica. Thank you. Bye. Bye.